Okay, so welcome to the second talk of the postcard session and Mr. Petros about real life Jason. Hello. Um, I don't know if I'm amplified or not, so I will be uh, projecting. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so thank you all for coming and for squeezing into the room. Um, my name is Christoph Pettis. I'm a consultant with a company called PostgreSQL Experts from the United States. Um, TheBuild.com here is my personal blog. These slides will be available there. Uh, PGExperts.com is the company website. And I'm on Twitter at um, XOF. And there's my email address. So, um, first of all, just as a quick summary, I assume everyone knows what JSON is, but just in case, the three pe for the three people in the room who might not, um, it's JavaScript object notation. It's a text format serial, um, for serializing structured data. It's um, based on uh, JavaScript's do um, declaration syntax, which is why it's which is where the JS comes from. And it was originally designed to be passed directly into JavaScript's eval function. Um, please don't do this ever. But um, <laughs> it's uh, so. Um, but it's intended to be very simple and easily parsable. Um, uh, JSON is always a, a text string. It's always Unicode. De facto, it's always UTF-8. At least when you see it when you see it in the wild. Um, it, um, the things you can have in it are numbers, integer and float, uh, strings of course, booleans, true and false, and null. And that's it. Um, you can structure them into arrays, um, into hashes or dictionaries, or whatever you call them. The JSON spec calls them objects, which is I think highly unfortunate, but there it is, uh, using braces. Um, you get string colon value. The keys have to be strings, the values can be anything. And everything else in JSON is built out of those. That's the entire JSON syntax. There's no type declaration mechanism. All that, it, anyone from the XML world, remember DTDs and all of that, the, all that's gone. Dad's, yeah, that, that was your father's de type declaration syntax. We don't use that anymore. Um, this makes object, I think, kind of an unfortunate terminology because it implies, you know, coming from an OO background, object means a lot of things to me that have nothing to do with this. It's a data structure. There's no schema or validation mechanism. It's up to the application. You get a blob and hope it was the blob you were looking for. So the good part about JSON is it's really simple to generate, um, to generate and parse. Um, the the, the um, ECMA spec is, uh, is five pages, most of them, pic most of them pretty pictures. So, um, and it's a de facto standard. Pretty much everybody who's building something new now is passing um, is passing um, JSON around. Uh, you still have post format, but people are doing that are wrong. Um, you have, um, there are bad things though. Um, there's no higher level standards of any kind on JSON. It is what it is. You get text strings. So how's the date time represented in JSON? I don't know. It, figure it out. <laughs> um, and remember SQL injection attacks? Well, now we have JSON injection attacks. So just because, you know, we were, I think things were getting a little too secure. And just don't use eval. Remember about not using eval? So still don't use eval. <laughs> and now, we're now the subject of the talk, which is Postgres has JSON. Um, it's a core type, so it's not, a, it's not a contrib module, it's not an extension, it's, you get it when the system starts up. It was first introduced in 9.2 and it was enhanced significantly in 9.3. And it, um, the basic type stores the incoming text literally. So you pass in a JSON blob, <laughs> Donk. It goes into the database exactly the way it is. Character, you presented it character for character. The white space and other formatting is all preserved in the JSON type. So it comes out exactly the way it went in. It validates it as being syntactically correct JSON. Of course, as we noted, there's a very large difference between sy syntactically and semantically interesting JSON. And it's just a type in Postgres's type system. It's fully transactional. You can have multiple JSON fields in a single table. Do whatever you want with them. It uses the toast mechanism, which we will talk about somewhat more extensively later. Um, it can be up to a gigabyte. So if you want to really want to throw around gigabyte size JSON fields in Postgres, knock yourself out. Um, it can be indexed, but right now indexing JSON fields is kind of boring. Um, but more good stuff is coming in this regard. And it can be nullable if you want, so like any field. Um, it comes complete with its own set of operators. There's the arrow operator, um, which uh, get, gets a JSON array element or object field. So you pass, so it's either an integer there or the key for it, um, 
for the field as JSON. If there's no match there, it returns null rather than an error. The arrow gets the array element or object field and casts it to text. Generally, if you're actually getting something out of the database, you want the double arrow because what you'll get back is something of type JSON from the single arrow. Um, there's also a path operator, um, which is hash arrow and the matching one. The path operator is kind of fun. Here's an example of it. Um, by using the path operator initially, it says, well, okay, get me the thing at offset two. And since the first thing is an array, it's that little blob. You say, well, okay, get me the thing at two and then the thing at one. So it's that thing. And then, or then, get me the thing at two, get me the thing at one, get me the thing at A. Notice no double quotes on the, no quotes on this guy. And then get four. So you can walk down the, the a nested JSON structure using that single operator. Kind of fun. And there's all sorts of JSON functions. Check out the documentation. There's all sorts of wonderful stuff. Um, you can turn, you can turn arrays to JSON and JSON to arrays. Postgres has its own built-in array type, and you can map from one to the other very nicely. JSON to row types. There's an aggregate function to build, you can build up a JSON structure out of the results of a query. Very handy, I've used that actually rather extensively already. So, you can index a JSON type, which means you're just indexing the literal text of the JSON field. Yeah, that's kind of not that useful, sorry. Um, but what is useful is you can use a functional index to create to, for a particular field, like, indexing all the first names that are stored in this thing, in the, in the field JSON blob, that's quite useful. Notice the double arrow there to turn it into a text, a text type. If you leave that off, you'll get an unhappy error message about how it can't figure out how to index a, a thing of type JSON. Okay, so we have this great thing, but what do we do with these tools we've been just handed, you know, clank onto the table? Well, you can use them to store attributes. So, you know, a, a typical example is in some e-commerce system, you have your catalog, it has an item table, it has lots of static columns like, you know, the name and this and that, although, you know, name could be dynamic if you're supporting multiple languages. Um, but there's some columns that are only present on a very small number of items. Not, you know, the, um, not everything has a color, or for example. Um, and which items have which things are unpredictable. So. And you generally, in, in this particular um, contrived example, you don't need to search or sort on just those attributes. You might, you might have them as part of a larger query, but you, you probably won't go out and say, get me everything in the entire system that's red. That would be kind of an odd query, although imaginable, I suppose. So you just use JSON. Have a single JSON field with those attributes. You can add it to as an additional predicate to the query. Oops, syntax error, that should be a double. Double um, thing. Why am I using double equal signs? I've been using writing too much Python. Um, but something to keep in mind is if this gets to be really common, if virtually, if say you know, twenty five percent of the things in the catalog have a uh, have a color, you might want to migrate into a traditional nullable column. So that's one very. But th this is one very very nice use of JSON. User defined columns. So you're shipping a package system, an accounting system, some uh, you know anything. And you allow the you allow the user to um, to define their own columns for things, their own attributes for things. And you know you kind of don't want to just create five things and call them user one, user two, user three. You know, that's kind of you know that, that can't be the right solution. Anytime you're a programmer, you start writing things like that. You know, so you should start getting a rash or something to tell you that this is obviously not the right answer. <laughs> Now, of course, we could just modify the schema at runtime, you know, add the column. Well, that's kind of painful. That's a lot of code. And that means every install is kind of a little bit different in terms of its schema, which makes your migration scripts that much more complicated. And you could use an EAV thing, but, but EAV is bad and you should never do it. And if you do, uh, this is, stands for entity attribute value, and, this, and we will never speak of this again. Click. Okay, so JSON to the rescue. Um, you just stick them all in a JSON field. If searching is required, you just create indexes on the appropriate ones, just like I showed you in the pre that create index thing. Much easier than table modifications. And you can and for for example, you may want to have a web front end that displays these attributes. You might be able to just pick up the JSON blob and fire it back up into the web application and have it do the parsing of things like that. Very nice. So maybe you want to store JSON because you need to store JSON. 
Um, for example, storing pre-calculated JSON for a web front end. It's very nice. You can return the entire JSON blob or just pieces of it. You know, let, let the database do the parsing and return the little bits out of it that you need. One of the things that now, since we're inside of Postgres land, oops, sorry, you can use a trigger to recalculate this stuff and maintain the cache, which is much nicer than having to cycle back and forth between the application. It's much more efficient. And sometimes you just have a JSON thing you need to store. You know, this validates it, which is really nice. Um, that gives you the full set of JSON operators to use to return and manipulate the data. And it enforces correctness on the way in, so you don't have bad JSON blobbing it up. Another use of this is auditing. Um, audit trails. Anyone who's ever had to build an, audit an automated mandatory audit trail for a relational database knows these things are a total pain in the neck. Um, so what do we do? Every, you want to log every change to a table. Well, we could create a separate table, but what if you have to log every table? Then you have a whole separate parallel set of tables. Oh, gross. Um, or you could have a whole single table, but what's in this whole single table? Well, JSON provides kind of an interesting what for this. You can write a trigger to serialize each row in, um, as it changes into a JSON blob. And potentially you could actually do a diff between new and old um, so, that, so that you only store the changes. Um, you store the JSON um, timestamp, et cetera, current database user. You could also use a relatively new feature of Postgres foreign data wrappers to store it in a remote database, which saves, which means you could store, um, store the audit trail even during rollbacks, since this is a different transactional environment. And you could also, um, uh, it also means that someone messing with the current database would probably not have, might not have access to the audit trail, so they couldn't mess with that as well. Okay, but how does all this kind of perform? Well, let's do some yak shaving here. Uh, it's been a long time creating the test scripts for this. So, um, first let's talk about how Postgres works a little bit internally. Fetching relational data is a really highly optimized path in Postgres, probably the most optimized path. It's nearly as fast as reading something out of a C-level structure. That's, that's the, the 1.0 unit that this is designed to work as fast as. The data is stored in a very compact binary format. Postgres is actually very efficient at how it stores data. Usually, um, the, the ratio between how it, um, a Postgres database and the data in, a, in say, a CSV or so, file or something like, or a binary format is very, very small. Um, and the data is returned back via libpq in a binary format. So it's really very efficient. JSON data, well, um, the JSON data has to be parsed each time, um, for each field each time or you return the whole blob, which, you know, so you can have the pleasure of parsing it. Um, and it might go, need to go to a toast table to fetch, the, uh, fetch a large blob and decompress it. So wait, I, I keep talking about this thing toast. Who knows what toast is in Postgres? Okay, about half, that's not bad. So, yes, we're toast. It's uh, the, just in case, it's the acronym is the oversized attribute storage technique. Postgres uses 8K database pages, unless you are one of the three people in the world who has recompiled Postgres to use a different size. Um, a single attribute, which is uh, a field, a column, et cetera, in Postgres, has to fit in that, in, in that 8K page, minus headers and other overhead, unless it's moved to the auxiliary toast table. In that case, just a pointer to the toast table is stored in the, in the main page in a way, and, that's at a pointer, and um, the rest of the data is stored in the toast table. Um, it's a compile time option at Postgres, um, how big an entity is before it'll be moved to the toast table. It's roughly 2K. Um, smaller things might fit in, uh, might be toasted if you, to make it fit if you have a lot of attributes that are starting to like crowd each other out. And any variable length item can be toasted. So, knowing that, let's do some performance testing on this. Um, so I created this test database with a million records it has a really simple schema. An ID, a first name, a last name, a company, and notes. Notes is specifically designed to not flatter Postgres. It's intended to be large enough to require toasting. Um, on the average, the, uh, in this database, the, um, it's 5,200 bytes in the notes field. The standard deviation is about 1,000 bytes. Um, so I created variations on this. A traditional relational schema. 
um, a table that's basically just the primary key and a single JSON blob, and that's it. A single JSON blob without the notes field to isolate the effects of, to of toasting. And um, I ran it all on this laptop. Um, ran everything with a hot cache. Um, so, so we get the uh, take out the effects of various things being. Um, I ran each test about a uh, most tests um, uh, ten times and threw away the low the highest and lowest results on each. Um, I tested both the query execution time and the results fetch time back from the query, and I'm running on the development version of Postgres 9.4 for for reasons which we'll talk about later. Um, I, everything's written in Python using PsychoPG2. Um, one of the things about PsychoPG2 that's both nice and not so nice, depending on what you're doing, is when it gets back something of type JSON, it automatically deserializes it into Python objects for you, which is great, but it isn't free. Um, so, and it adds overhead to fetching the JSON data if, if you're not actually going to use it parsed out like that. So, for this test, I cast everything to text, so I get back just the text blob without the interpretation. So some caveats. Just when you look at these times, interpret them as relative and not absolute. Um, you know, I, they are real units, they're milliseconds, but they might as well be quad loops. I mean, they're, they're completely arbitrary units because my laptop does not map to any real life production environment. Um, all the data return times are for getting the row and throwing it away immediately. So any further processing is in addition to this, so it's always going to be more expensive the way you, when you do it. So, test results. Bang. First test, just fetch the ID column, which is a big int from the table. Um, for relational data, it's just select ID. For JSON data, it's select ID, it's select JSON blob arrow, arrow, um, um, arrow ID, casting it to big int. And I ran it for both the note and no note versions of JSON. Remember, in the case of the no note one, there's no t toast table. Hmm. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. There's relational, there's without the note, and there's with the note. That's dramatic. Just to break them out a little bit more, here's relational, and here's JSON without the note column. And here's JSON without note, JSON with the note. Well, okay, yeah, that, that was illustrative. Um, relational data is a lot faster for returning a, a simple scalar value than parsing it out of a JSON blob. I hope no one is terribly surprised by this, but the results are very dramatic. Um, Richie's, um, getting the JSON blob out of the toast, um, out of toast results a huge speed decrease. Really, thing grinds to a slow, grinds to a stop. So now we're going to get the company field, which is basically, you know, is vaguely a var, sort of like a var, varchar 40. Um, so you fetch the company t uh, field from the entire table. For the relational um, data, just um, select it and send it back. JSON extract and return. And run it for both. Well, that looks pretty familiar. <coughs> um, yeah. Pretty much the same result. Um, so what we know is detoasting dominates this. The, um, the, re the retrieval time is roughly constant in all cases. No notice that in these it's really, the, all the variation is in actually producing the result set, not feeding it back. <clears throat> now, let's fetch the note column from the table. This is, the, this is a, um, a text field. Again, uh, um, the, the average is about 5,200 bytes. Um, Lisa did just select it, set it back, extract the return. Huh. Suddenly, JSON doesn't look so bad. Um, basically, they're like, tiny bit, but worse. But Otherwise, pretty much the same. The um, the the, uh, the query execution time is a little bit longer, but actually the result, but that a lot of that um, delta is made up for in a faster return, which is interesting. Um, again, the detoasting time swamps the um, uh, swamps the uh, uh, anything else in the um, in the query, so that's interesting. So the next one is let's fetch all the data back as JSON as a JSON structure. So for the relational data, I actually use the row to JSON function. Just pass in um, star as the, and have it create a JSON structure out of, the, um, um, out of the relational data. And for relational data, we just return the relational blob. Um, and for baseline, I want to do just a select star on the relational data to see how it compares to that. 
Okay, well that's actually very interesting. Um, the relationalist JSON is basically the same. It's actually a tiny bit faster, which is totally counterintuitive. Um, a little longer to execute, but getting the result back makes up for that time. JSON's actually faster than both. <coughs> hmm, well that's interesting. Um, so part of this is the deserialization time within PsychoPG2 is not trivial. So when it's selecting the um, relational data, it's having to build the row object and populate each thing and, and um, create separate objects for that. So there's a lot of mallocs going on, as opposed to the JSON where it's returning one text field. Um, again, remember, it's that we're not actually using PsychoPG2 to create the internal text structure. So it's returning effectively returning a single text field. So moral of the story here is if you're returning JSON, return, if, you, if what you want is JSON, use JSON. So, next one is fetch a single random note value. Um, we, we just have a whole list of all the primary keys and pick a random subset. Um, I believe I picked 50,000. It was run over 50,000. So, for both of these, we use the primary key index. And, huh, <coughs> once again, this is, this is to return a single row. Um, so, point, um, 0.6 milliseconds. JSON actually wins again. Although, admittedly, that's well within the margin of error. So I, 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 would not say, I would not guarantee a performance boost across a whole application. Again, it's largely detoasting time. Has to get the, has to get the note out of the database. And thing, such a thing called single ID. Again, same methodology. Relational JSON uses primary keys. OK, this is not within the margin of error. Um, relational is a lot faster. <coughs> And unsurprising, um, uh, didn't have, unsurprising because there's no detoasting involved here in the relational case. It just has to grab the row and bring it, it grab that single field, that single big end field and return it. Here, it's having to grab the JSON blob, parse it apart, uh, cast the result, all this stuff. So I'm actually surprised it performed as well as it did, frankly. Okay, and disk footprint. Essentially the same. JSON is actually a little bit smaller, tiny bit. So no significant um, uh, disk footprint benefit either way. So now that we know that, what do we know? Um, detoasting is expensive. Um, when it's possible, move the fields to the main structure um, instead of creating large <coughs> JSON blobs. First of all, you keep your JSON blob size down, which prevents having to spill to toast. Also, it's just faster to return things out of the relational structure. And if toasting is inevitable, JSON performs completely, has nothing to, has, uh, nothing to worry about in terms of performance. Also, be aware of the overhead on your driver. That can often swamp everything else that's going on. All, you know, the, um, drivers are, the, the language drivers often have a lot of really sophisticated features. PsychoPG2 has lots of lots and lots of great features, but nothing is free. So, warnings about tips and tricks. One thing about writing to JSON is schemaless means there's no schema. So it's all just strings. There's no internal structure, there's no internal structure except that which you give it. So there's no enforcement of field presence or absence, there's no referential integrity. All that has to be handled in the application or in a trigger in the database. So remember you're signing up for that if you're using JSON to store as your primary data store. Now, notice that this is a wonderful thing about doing all this in Postgres is Postgres has facilities to make all this work. There are no built-in complex types in JSON. You have, um, you have numbers, strings, booleans, the null value, and that's it. So everything else is by application convention. So again, date times are a great example because um, which date time, you know, there, there's so many different ways of writing a date time. Are you including time zones? If you're not including time zone, how are you interpreting the time zone information of the date time? Blah, blah, blah. Are you sure every application that's reading this data is, has signed up to the same standard? Some language libraries have serialization, deserialization for support for complex types. 
for example, Psycho PG2 uses um, Lodus, uh, uses um, Lodus um, standard in Python, which does have support for doing this kind of stuff, which is nice. So you don't have to remember to write it in every parts of your application. Also, so you figure, is missing the same as null? You know, if, if, if you have a colon null, is that the same as not a not being there at all? Make up your mind. So remember that Postgres considers the entire JSON field as a single unit and returns the entire thing if you ask for it. Um, that's much less efficient than parsing out individual fields within the database. So move, again, fields that are common, 10% or more of the rows to relational fields. That's a, that 10% number is totally made up. Um, analyze it for your own application, but that's kind of my rule of thumb. If you're, if, if um, migrating in, in, into the relational structure results in 10% or fewer, or, um, or uh, fewer nulls, or 90% or fewer nulls, it's probably a good idea to do it. Remember that nulls in Postgres take up no space. You get a null value does not take it does not take up any space in the database, and you get you get much better indexing. You can just build an index straight on that field, and just use the JSON for stuff that really is loosely structured. So that's post that's what we have right now. But now we have the future. So coming in 94, all sorts of new functions for Postgres for Postgres in Postgres for JSON. There's some performance enhancements and the JSON B type. Anyone heard about this yet? Mm -hmm. You will. It's a binary representation of JSON. Um, it's more compact, it's faster to operate on, and it's based on the same storage format as the equally new nested H store type. But this is built, again, this is a core, JSONB is a core type. You, it's not an extension or a contrib module. You get it when Postgres starts up. Um, has the same size limitations as the original ones. But, you know, if you're throwing around gigabyte size JSON fields, you probably want to rethink what, what your life path that brought you here. <laughs> so, the first question one would ask is, wait, we have a whole new type? Why didn't you just do this to JSON? And the problem is, the instant we introduced JSON, everyone started using it the wrong way. For example, they relied on preserve the, the white space pre preserving feature of JSON, which was bad. You should they shouldn't have done that. They're they're horrible people, and they made us and look what they made us do. Um, they had duplicate keys at the object at the same object level. The spec says you ought not to do this. Which is really unfortunate language because ought not to meant being in a spec means go ahead and do it. <laughs> and so people do. And the problem is the binary format doesn't allow this. As it, you know, as the Hague Convention fr frankly shouldn't allow it either, but you know, there we are. Um, so if you need white space pres preservation or duplicate keys at the same level, you'll need to stick with the JSON type. Oh well. As always, some caveats. It's not committed yet. Until it's committed, it's not real. And anything can happen between now and then. But it looks pretty good. Probably will be a 9.4. Well, so great, but how does this perform? Okay. So, return all IDs. Yeah, okay, that's an improvement. Not bad. Return all companies. Yeah, about the same speed up. Return all notes. Hmm, not so good. A little bit better, but again, the detoasting time swamps everything else. Return all the uh, all data. This is actually returning the the JSON blob itself. Huh? JSONB actually didn't perform as well. That's interesting. I wonder why that would be. We will talk about this. Disk footprint. Yeah, basically the same across all of them. Okay. So JSONB generally wins in performance. Um, JSON right now wins in this test environment when returning the whole blob, since the JSON B has to be converted to a text field. Um, right now, we can't return the actual binary representation of the JSON B back to this particular driver. So language drivers matter. Psycho PG2 is very feature rich, but it's not necessarily a super fast way of getting the stuff back. I love Psycho PG2, don't get me wrong, but you just need to understand that it's mallocking all over the place to build this stuff. Um, 
Other good parts about it will allow efficient support for additional operators, like does J contain key X? Does J contain any of these keys? The syntax is not the actual Postgres syntax. I just need to fit, fit it on the slide. Um, does J contain any of these keys? You get the idea. These are these, um, so those, those are, if you're familiar with HSTAR, HSTAR has these operators. JSON B will have them too. And the containment operators. Is this, um, does this contain this, et cetera? And it allows for efficient uh, just engine indexing of JSON types, which will be really super nice. Just indexes are good to accelerate the containment operators, those guys. JIN is good for accelerating those guys. And uh, the availability of these are TBD. I'm working on them right now. We'll see if they get in. <laughs> and it, it might, we might have to do it as an extension to 9.4 because 9.4 is getting pretty busy. There's a lot of traffic piled up on the 9.4 commitment road right now. And we'll see. And of course, okay, let's talk about MongoDB. Because la last time I, last presentation I gave a year ago, I talked a fair about compared uh, Postgres' performance with MongoDB. MongoDB came, ended up not looking really good in that one. So let's see, now we have all this JSON stuff, let's see how it looks. So running the same basic tests um, using perspectives. I can't believe Mongo's terminology sometimes. Okay, uh, to control which field come back, return all the documents and we iterate over them, grab a document, throw it away, grab a document, throw it away. And we're, this is on 249 which is what I get when I use Mac ports to install MongoDB. So return all IDs. Hmm, okay. Well, now we're not laughing. Um, <laughs> that's pretty good, especially when you compare it to the built-in JSON stuff. Uh, return all IDs. Okay, so let's zoom in on the two since those were, there were like two clusters there. Uh, the relational, compared to relational MongoDB is quite a bit slower. Um, Return one ID, again, slower, you know, not within the, the within error, but close. So return all the notes. Hmm. Yeah, okay, MongoDB actually does really well there. Return, and then return all IDs for last name starting with A. Relational MongoDB again. Again. This is with no note. This is a totally unfair comparison, just to be clear, because this is scanning over much less data than these guys. But again, I wanted to factor out the, to the, the effects of toasting. And uh, you know, so JSONB, in the non-toast case, actually performs a little better than MongoDB. And relational definitely performs better. And this footprint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. It's, sorry, that's a, that's a quick kill if you're if you're saying if you want to be be amused about Mongo. Okay, so what do we know? So yeah, toasting is expensive. Um, I want to run another series of tests, tweaking the toast parameters, like how big the object is before it goes into the toast table, turning compression on and off, stuff like that. But toasting is expensive. Um, the downside is that it does have to process whole documents to do things which does make it significantly slower than um, for relational data. And again, the driver architecture matters. I would strongly suspect that it's more efficient, that, that MongoDB's driver has to do a lot less processing than, than, a, um, than, something that's than a Python library that's interfacing with, with libpq. And that, that does matter. So the one slide over simplification of the entire talk. For the basic set of attributes, if you're using PostgreSQL, use relational data. Use JSON for extended attributes. If you have um, a wide range of attributes with a wide range of sizes, consider splitting into them into the big, the big stuff and the small stuff, so that the big stuff is toasted and the small stuff isn't, so you don't have to pay the toast overhead when you're getting at the small stuff. Or um, just um, or give uh, give big stuff its own attributes. If you have one giant text field, just create a text column in Postgres. And again, if you're using really big stuff, put it in the file system already. You'll you'll be much happier. And just put a link to, and and use a file and put a path to the file system in the database. And that's my talk. Questions? Sir, um, I uh, did some experiments uh, in a similar 
different context um, with um, comparing a lightweight compressor against raw data storage with raster data. And it turns out the thing that dominated the experiments was whether we had artificially generated the test data set, mm -hmm. which is real data. Because when you artificially generate your test data sets, there's a tendency to make random data, and it's really bad to compress. It takes right. lots of space, lots of time. So what did you use for your... Lor uh, lorem ipsum. Um, because uh, obviously cr cr um, a variable length string of A's I know would compress in a very different way. I mean, I won't care, you know, lorem ipsum is, is a, only the uh, randomish approximation of a natural language, but it's, uh, I think it's better than, than either the, the two extremes, which are totally random letters or, you know, a set of A's. So I think it's, I, I think it's, I, I would say we're, we're probably in the right ballpark using lorem ipsum. It's probably not um, great, you know, it, it, probably if you were feeding actual real lang natural language in it, the performance would be different, but it's close enough, you know. Did the, you use that for every field then, or? Uh, no, I, for the, um, for the, I used, um, for the first name and last name and company, I used actual first name, last name and company database, um, um, database. I believe it was the NASDAQ database I used for company and um, um, Social Security Administration databases for the first and last names. So those are real data, mm -hmm. but those are small enough that they weren't going to be toasted and compressed anyway. So. That's perfect. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Sir. Uh, so a few questions. Uh, no, I, I, I don't at this point. I must admit I'm a little embarrassed by it because it was kind of hacked up. Uh, there's a reason I call it yak sha shaving code. At some point, people enough people have asked me for it that I think I want to do something a little um, so that, uh, a little more um, interesting for it. There's really not much to it, I will say, though. It's like a five-line Python um, Python function. Um, yeah, a year ago I did a talk. I didn't, you know, there's only so much I can do in one talk. I did a talk about it. Um, generally, HStore was um, was a, was was faster than JSON um, because of the binary rep because HStore has always used a binary underlying representation, unlike JSON. Um, and XML was a lot slower than the others because uh, because of its of its high overhead and its fairly verbose nature. So. Um, I would expect that HStore and JSONB to run at about the same speed because they actually, the code is extremely similar between them. Like cut and paste similar in many cases. <coughs> Any other questions? Things? Sir. You mostly talked about a query. Uh, how about uh, write performance? Is there any insights you could provide on that? Um, generally, the. Um, um, as of as of the last time I ran the numbers, I, again that that kind of got squeezed out of the, the presentation for length. I do want to do I'll, I'll do blog posts about the other stuff. I will say to reiterate what I found last year is that um, relational data is extremely fast to load compared to the, any of the others. That is even more so than the query performance. The um, and um, uh, eight, eight, uh, the JSON um, and XML were relatively performant to load because compared to anything else, the others, because it doesn't have to do anything to them to load them. It just writes, you know, they're just text things that write, get written to disk. Um, HStore was a little bit slower because it has to parse it and create the binary format. So, um, but the, the, there was, and um, the, the, the distinction, but there was sort of HStore and everything else, HStore, um, JSON and XML and all those guys up here as one big cluster that were roughly as equivalent, and then relational way down here as being mm -hmm. super much, much faster. What will be the future of VH engine uh, after uh, Postgres has a, will publish the 9.4 version? Well, um, the the PLV8 is there, and it, you know, it, and it's great, and it works. It's not part of the Postgres distribution. It's not a, it's so um, it, you have to build it and install it separately um, as part of uh, um, as part of it. But um, it's um, the 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 um, the big inefficiency in using V8 is the PL bridging overhead. I've noticed once you're inside of once you're in V8, it runs really really fast. Um, there is some bridging overhead, though. This you mostly notice this in things that you're calling a lot, like when you're doing index creation. 
using a, a PLV8 function and things like that. You know, it's calling it once per row and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I didn't have time to talk about PLV8, but check it out. Um, the only caveat I have always with PLV8 is use the V8 engine that comes with PLV8. Don't build it against an exist a separate PLV8 because you will spend you will spend your entire time trying to figure out how to make that build system. I don't know how Google. I mean, Google must I, they must do this internally at Google all the time. But man, it's complicated. So, other questions? Okay, thank you very much.